Jemiah Calvin um, from the west side of Chicago, um, the Austin community. Uh, I'm an artist, uh, been drawing since first grade, big comic book collector, love anime, father, four sons, just black man doing my thing, you know? So yeah. that's me. I started drawing, um, I was inspired by comic books, you know, when I was a kid, um, I would read comic books a lot. I still do. Um, and that's what influenced my art um, as a youth, you know. From there, I continued um, at age 14. I, my first job was with Gallery 37, um, downtown Chicago, um, where I was actually introduced and influenced by other artists around Chicago, teenagers and age group my age. And later I went to college, years later, um, after military and things like that, and got a degree in um, fine art with an emphasis in painting. So that's about it. I mean, yeah, for the most part. Um, right now I'm reading The Last Ronin. Sometimes I go back and read some of the older books I have, like uh, that got good stories. Uh, a lot of Mark Millar books. I love this. He great writer. You know, uh, Super Crooks, Jupiter's Legacy, the book. Um, those type of books. Um, I love reading. Um, my favorite story of all time is the Thanos Quest. A lot of people think he was just a villain, but he he was a psychological genius um, and power. So that that's one of my favorite books of all time. Um, and uh, oh, 100 Bullets. That is a must read classic. Um, just because there's a lot of truth in some of that stuff that people don't want to believe, you know. Um, and it makes you ask yourself, what would you do in this situation, you know, because the story is based around this government agency that's really powerful and they find random people and they give them a gun with 100 bullets and tell them, look, if you can shoot or kill anybody in the world or do whatever you want with these hundred bullets scot-free, what would you do? You know, it's a suitcase full of bullets and because of those bullets and that gun, as long as you do what you do with that gun and those bullets, you're not gonna be charged with it. And it challenges and acts, basically in my opinion, I feel like it challenges your human nature. <laughs> you know, like, you never know what a person may do or, you know, what type of trauma somebody had in their childhood, who they would go back and, you know, so it's, it's dark, but it makes you think about things like that, you know, so 100 Bullets is a really, really good book to read um, if you like that type of shit, you know, so. Ninja Scroll, um, I saw that young teenager and it blew my mind to see that type of shit in the cartoon. <laughs> like, that blew my mind. Ninja Scroll, um, Cowboy Bebop, top five. Samurai Champloo. I'm watching JoJo's Bizarre Adventures and that's, that's tripping me out right now. Like, I can't stop watching it. That, that's better than I expected it to be. Naruto, both. Regular and Shippuden, both. Those were outstanding. Um, Bleach, Bleach. Um, I still actually um, have this debate because me personally, I think both of those are better than Dragon Ball Z. I watched Dragon Ball Z as a teenager and a kid and I thought it was the best anime ever, but then when I got older, I realized, okay, the writing on here is much better, you know, and they don't prolong everything, <laughs> you know, so, um, um, and Demon Slayer, I like Demon Slayer. All-time favorite shoe, Air Max 95. Um, I was working at Gallery 37 when that came. I was 14 years old, 1995, when I saw that shoe that was mind-blowing for all sneakerheads and kids that love sneakers at the time. Air Max 95, I paint in Air Max 95s. I have a pair of broken-in Air Max 95s to this day, I paint in them. Favorite Jordan, the fourth. Under that is the most underrated Jordan, in my opinion, the twos. Chicago, the, the white and red Chicago. 
Um, those are my favorite two Jordans, um, period. I remember when they came out. Me personally, when I buy Jordan retros, I stop after 13. Like, one through 13 is all I will ever wear. Any Jordan after that, I won't wear it, you know? Because those I remember vividly from a kid all the way up until high school. Um, and I remember when they came out, I remember the impact that they had. Um, my first pair of Jordans ever, I was in kindergarten. I had the black cement threes. My mom bought them for me, you know, um, for my birthday, you know, so. Let's see, you say, I say uh, MX-95 is my favorite shoe. The shoe that I remember the most when it came out is the phone posit. I was working at Finish Line in the 90s. Uh, it was my high school job. And I remember when we got those, and it was, we had never seen anything like that ever. And at the time, that was like the most expensive shoe. And if I'm not mistaken, that shoe was $150 in 97. You know, looking now, the shoe was 220. But that that was an iconic shoe, and a lot of people wasn't wearing it then. A lot of people thought that shoe was ugly, or you know, I loved it. You know, it was the Penny Hardaway. I loved it, um, but a lot of people did not like that. And when I went to the military and I lived on the East Coast, that was the big shoe for everybody from D.C. That was their shoe. I think. People from D.C. is the reason why the phone posit blew up the way it did. You know, they wore phone posits like every, like in New York, the way they wore the white Air Force Ones and, you know, how we like the Jordan Ones here in Chicago. D.C. rocked all types of phone posits, and I think they're the reason why everybody else loved it like that, so. You know, me and a couple of buddies was talking about it, you know, the era before social media. You know, there was nothing like when you knew a shoe was coming out and you had to go on the other side of town to try to find who had it, you know, everybody didn't know about it. It wasn't just easy access. You could go to this mall, you know what I'm saying, whether it was Evergreen Plaza, Forest City, North Riverside, you know, Brickyard. Um, and if they didn't have it, you know, you'd go on Madison, you know, tops and bottoms on Madison to see if you could still find this shoe. Um, and if you wanted the exclusives, I remember a lot of people would go to New York that was the thing back in the 90s where people would go to New York to try to find the flyest kicks, you know. That was the good days. It was fun, you know. It's like a treasure hunt back then. Yeah, man, I've been so busy. I'm like way off with dates and things like that. Oh, this is dope. <laughs> this is dope. Oh, shit. Yeah, I like this. This is, wow, you see your artwork on right. product, man. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm giving my mom this bag. When you gave me um, that title, Poetry and Motion, to work off of it, I was like, okay, I like that, you know. I like that title a lot. But it made me think of um, a lot of the stuff that was happening last year around that time when, you, when we first discussed this. And my art, you know, um, because again, you know, I was, you know, with the murals, I, I like to do a lot of representation in my art. Um, I feel like it has to be out there. It's, it's my responsibility, my duty to put it out there. And um, just where I was at, you know, um, with the, the mixture of abstract, um, but the beauty of black people, you know, um, and, you know, I struggle, but yet, resilience and overcoming a lot of things, you know, and still being here and still being able to be great, still being able to just live and have greatness in life, you know what I'm saying, Through all, throughout all obstacles, you know. And to me, that's poetry and motion itself, you know what I'm saying, to actually just continue to push forward no matter what's thrown at us in our way and get up every day, you know, smile, just make things happen, you know. That's what it's about. Life changing in a good way. If it's, I'm not gonna say if, I'm gonna speak it in existence. When it becomes life changing in a good way for the youth and future generations, that means a lot to me. That means I did what I was destined to do, you know. Um, granted, as artists, we all wanna be in certain, have our work in 
these major institutions and collections and things like that. But at the end of the day, what good is it if it doesn't change somebody's life in a positive way, you know? And I want to continue to change people's life in a positive way, make people actually sit up and think, you know what I'm saying, and discuss why I created what I created. You know, because as an artist, I'm a documentarian of right now, you know, so when I create, I'm creating things of right now, what I experience, what my people experience, and things that we know, you know what I'm saying, whether it's from things that encountered in the 80s, the 90s, to today, you know, I can create about that because I've experienced things that happen. And one of the things that I always think about as an artist is when I was a teenager, I remember someone telling me, oh, you don't want to be an artist, artists don't make money. You're going to be broke. Artists don't make money until they die. And that's one of those things where you have to really be careful what you tell the youth or what you tell kids because I believe that shit, <laughs> you know? I was young, I believed that, and it made me not want to become an artist no more. So when I graduated high school, I didn't do art. I tried to find a job, a good paying job, went to the military, I tried to do all of these things. And no matter how much money I made, I still felt unfulfilled, not knowing why. And I'm glad that I got back to my roots. I got back into art and to meet other artists and get into this community that pushes me, that encourages me, that actually inspires me and we inspire each other. And to watch us all grow, that's a great thing to me. And for any youth or young kid that wants to be an artist, just let them know, like, you can do that, you know? That's a lie, you know, for someone to tell you that artists don't make money, or artists don't do this, that's a lie, you know? We all here today because of it. And during the pandemic, artists, we were the ones that kept the world going around because a lot of people were actually losing their minds. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? With everything that was going on around the world, and it was artists that created beautiful images all around to just keep people going. I was part of a group show at Articles Gallery at Lacuna Loft with um, Oscar Joyo and um, on Instagram, Caldish Gambino Cal, um, with, at Articles Gallery. Um, shout out to them. Um, it was a great, great group show. Star lineup of artists that was in that. Um, and that's going to continue going on all the way up until Saturday the 3rd, that show. So check that out at Articles Gallery. Um, I also I have a solo show coming up September 25th with Vertical Project Space. It's called Nothing Was Ever The Same Again. So working on that, you know, finishing up some of the last pieces for that show. And in December, I got some other things lined up. So stay tuned for that, you know, just going to be busy. And when I'm not doing that, I'm going to be out here still painting walls, representing, doing what I do. So it's going to be a great, great year, great year.